Thank you. Um, so I wanted to start today with a book published in 2012 called Melanie's uh, Marvelous Measles, uh, the story of a little girl who gets measles and gets better and then has natural immunity and it's marvelous. Um, and then on the back it says, um, history shows that in industrialized countries these diseases were quite benign and beneficial to the body. Okay, so what are the responses that we can have? So one response, right, is to <laughs> make up our own the Stephanie Messenger uh, books. Um, there's been a number of these, uh, right? So you can be snarky or you can um, say, okay, well, actually, um, smallpox and polio, as Dr. Loeb has shown us, are uh, very serious diseases. They were very serious and awful in the past, and they're still serious and awful. And that uh, it's just people about 10 years younger, uh, 10 years older than I am, that remember a kid in school who was in an iron lung, or a kid who had braces from polio, or um, whose mom had had German measles. So in some ways, right, we're the victim of our own success that um, these uh, vaccinations are so successful that you don't see those kinds of problems anymore. And you can also show the kinds of statistics um, that we saw before. But you know and I know that that's not enough, right? That anti-vaccination is a social movement, that it's organized. This is an example of a website that they use children's books. Melanie's Measles is one of many. Um, uh, celebrities, uh, public protests, and then um, Andrew Wakefield, the author of that discredited study, has become the patron saint of this uh, movement, and he is uh, persecuted, right? He's Because uh, he's telling us the truth, uh, so, so-called. So, um, what I uh, th this started me on a journey to talk to many people, many friends about um, what they were concerned about about vaccination, and um, open-ended questions got issues at many different levels of the problem, and I just wanted to look at um, some of these concerns. They are not new. Um, these are quite old, actually, and I just uh, took a selection of some of them. So why should I vaccinate my child for other children? Am I responsible for other people's health? Vaccine isn't natural, so how about using something natural? What about thalidomide, which is not even a vaccine? <laughs> <laughs> right? But any kind of regulatory or public health fail, and aren't pharmaceutical companies just promoting vaccines to make big profits, and they're hiding the fact that they're not safe, et cetera, right? So these are social and political issues, really, and not really science. So vaccination education needs to address the full range of public concerns and use social strategies. So very quick. Um, history of vaccination itself. So first we had nothing and then we had variolation. Variolation is, uh, was practiced traditionally in Africa, Asia, uh, Latin America, and the Islamic world. So this lady, Larry, uh, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, wife of the British ambassador to the Ottoman uh, court, styling here in her um, <laughs> Ottoman style English outfit, um, saw variolation, which is to take lymph from a person infected with smallpox and introduce it into a small um, incision on a healthy uh, person who then develops um, a very mild case, in principle, of smallpox and then develops immunity and gets better. So the problem with variolation is that in 1 to 3 percent of the cases, you can develop a full-blown case of smallpox, one problem. She had her own children engrafted, um, one in the Ottoman Empire and then one back um, in England, and then she be, was sort of um, impressed the royal court and the princess and the king both um, supported supported this, and then it was uh, practiced more widely. So Jenner, um, who you may have heard of, was a surgeon and a physician, um, and he noticed that milkmaids in the countryside did not, had the smooth complexions. They did not have the pock marks of, um, of smallpox. And um, they told him, because I had cowpox, I don't get smallpox. And cowpox is uh, a cow disease but that people can get, right? So he conjectured that infection with cowpox would give people immunity from smallpox. And he took lymph from this woman, Sarah Nelms, and injected a little boy with it. This is in the pre-medical um, ethics era. Um, and then um, exposed him to smallpox, and indeed he was protected. 
so this word vaccination comes from the word for smallpox, vaccine, um, uh, uh, which means right cow. And then he has this 1798 paper. So um, first they had human arm-to-arm -arm transmission, but that um, uh, is obviously dangerous for obvious reasons, right? If someone has other types of infections like syphilis, you can transmit that too. So um, by 1860 or so, they took lymph from animals that were infected with um, cowpox and scrape that and then in, introduce that um, to, um, to healthy people. So the reaction to vaccination was uh, right away. Many people were disgusted and did not want, did not like the idea of being infected with an animal disease in order to be protected from smallpox. That didn't go over really so well, you would think. And uh, vaccination was not as hygienic and pleasant as it is now. They had to score you with a big knife, right? They, they, they didn't have sterility. You could have infection. You could have gangrene. Um, and then the idea of introducing an animal disease or animal matter to your body is horrifying, scary um, 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 in, in itself. So this, this had to be uh, persuaded and sold. This is uh, an 1802 um, cartoon by James Gilray, who's a very famous um, British um, satirical cartoonist, who was also anti-vaccine. So um, a version of this fear as well is um, what is in vaccine? Um, so it isn't a new fear, it's an old fear. What is this? And, and, and um, I'm sure uh, Dr. Miller will talk more about the cultivation of vaccine itself and the, the role of um, of animal products in, in doing that. So the second concern and the second fear is about the government um, and the entry of the government either into one's body and or into one's family. So um, compulsory vaccination laws were introduced with strong penalties for non-compliance, especially in the UK. So this um, 1853 UK Vaccination Act made uh, vaccination mandatory for infants um, up to three months, and then um, that was um, an, another law in 1867, um, children up to 14 years old. Um, a very, um, at that time, um, strong penalty of 20 shillings if you didn't comply, and if you didn't have the money to pay, they could seize your assets and, and auction them. Um, so it was, um, there was very strong resistance to vaccination, especially in, um, in these um, uh, types of uh, police actions. Um, and anti-vaccine societies were formed um, in the UK in 1866, and also in Canada, and also in the United States. So what kinds of things did they write about? One was fear of uh, children dying or being sacrificed, as they said, to this vaccinator's lance, um, that um, one's personal and political liberty was um, infringed upon, um, and there were uh, public protests. And they also, like today, um, had a propaganda machine. They had uh, journals, um, the anti-vaccinator and so forth. And they also, um, for example, the Anti-Vaccination League of America disputed the science. They said smallpox is not a contagious disease. It is caused by environmental sanitation and filth. Um, so um, many of those things are not new. Something to think about that is um, recurring then is this um, fear of interference in the family and of the parents. So this underlines, I think, the importance of what Dr. Pernica said, which is to enlist the parents and make the parent the ally um, of the physician. There's no reason why there has to be that opposition. So because there was this um, resistance, there were modifications to the legal structure. So the Vaccination Act of 1898 removes the penalties for the failure to vaccinate children and introduces this conscientious objector clause for parents. But still, in 1905, the U.S. Supreme Court rules that the state can enact laws that uh, protect the public in the event of a communicable disease. Um, and I wanted to show you at least this image from 1947 of New Yorkers lined up, um, up and down the streets waiting for smallpox vaccination. But the fact that I had to get it out of a published book and that when you put vaccine into the internet, you have nothing but anti-vaccine images. Anti-vaccine rules the internet. Where is the pro-vaccine ruling the internet? Nevertheless, <laughs> because we're having measles outbreak, mandatory vaccination laws are making a comeback, right? With an appeal to the public good and in the place in California, right, where there is the strongest anti-vaccine movement and there were the most measles cases in May 15th, um, 
a controversial bill mandating school vaccinations sails through the California Senate. So when there is an outbreak, people get behind vaccine. And it's happening here as well. You can see the same conversation happening here. And this um, discussion of, um, in a CNN poll about whether there should be mandatory vaccine for children. So a third concern is that government is not regulating vaccine safety effectively. Because why? Any failure of government regulation. Thalidomide, which was not a vaccine, <laughs> which was only on the market for one year, um, which was never approved by the FDA and did not even, uh, was not even sold in the United States. So why is my friend, who is in the U.S., so terrified of thalidomide? Because it caused horrendous uh, birth defects. Um, and um, this, um, any kind of fail makes such a long-lasting impression, including, I noticed a question about, um, doesn't polio vaccine cause polio? It doesn't, right? But Jonas um, Salk... Um, registered the, the, the vaccine in 1954, which he refused to patent. He said, you cannot patent the sun. He could have made billions of dollars on it, and he walked away from it, and he gave it to humanity. And what happens? In 1955, the Cutter Laboratories prepare it incorrectly. And instead of uh, releasing attenuated vaccine, they, re they release live polio virus, 120,000 doses, and 40,000 kids get sick. And of that, five die, and a much smaller proportion have serious consequences. So um, can you imagine how crushing this was for not just this family, the health of, of the country, but for Sock himself, who said, you know, I, I feel that in some way this is something I'm associated with. So uh, the, the fourth concern um, is um, that government also isn't regulating because someone's making some money. That there are some vast fortunes to be made. And this, uh, in, in the past, it was doctors who were accused of promoting vaccination to enrich themselves. And today, it's big pharma um, accused of profiting from vaccines and that um, government doctors and scientific studies are, are being bought uh, by big pharma and thus are not reliable. Um, so I, I think, though, that this... That there is some difference and that um, it's worth it to take a, a look at and think about and unpack this, right? That there is this sense, look at this, um, this film, for example, that um, vaccine, big pharma, and your food, like somehow Monsanto or these big companies or these big polluters that are polluting the environment, that are polluting the food supply, that there's the use of all these pesticides that are harming your health, and that there isn't sufficient regulation, that they're also polluting your body in a similar way, right? And so that uh, this is something that, that seems out of control. So by uh, the same way that you're going to um, grow your own food in your own house, and that way you won't be um, vulnerable to this. There is this idea, oh, I will just treat myself at home with my naturopath um, or with my food remedy or with my other remedies and opt out. So in the past, public health used education strategies that now are co-opted by the anti-vaccination movement. And I think there's a certain amount of complacency because vaccine is so effective. We think it's a slam dunk. And clearly, it's not a slam dunk. <laughs> Still, there are concerns. So um, what happens right after the 1955 um, uh, debacle? 1956, Elvis gets vaccinated, and they have sock hops, S-A-L-K hops, for teenagers. OK? And then you have also this um, um, speaking to the everyman, right? They show this, um, this man concerned. Um, think it over. This is John Jones, breadwinner, head of a happy family, man of action. He wasn't scared either, right? And then 1957, this is John Jones, ex-breadwinner, polio patient, man of inaction. And if you drive, I think it's on King, you will see a billboard that has exactly the same strategy persuading police officers to wear bulletproof vests. It is 100% the same. You could either be the, the father of your family or you could be a burden on your family, and the difference is this bulletproof vest. So it's, um, it's a very um, effective strategy. So to conclude, what I would suggest is that if there are social concerns, right, you need to have 
social solutions. And vaccine needs to become cool. And I don't say that in a flip way. I say that it, it, it has to be sort of a peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication strategy. So what we're doing right now is from the state and the government level, which is good, right? Um, legislation, mandatory vaccination works, but it's controversial and there's pushback. And there has to be an emphasis on the public good that we are legislating. I mean, we obviously, we have a democratic process. We vote for our legislators. Um, it's not being imposed by a dictatorship. But um, there will be pushback. There's always pushback to mandatory vaccination. Um, we have to think about vaccine um, not being a slam dunk that people do need to be persuaded and educated. Um, and we need to have a media conversation that is not like the recent front line, which was called the vaccine war, where there's the, the vaccine side and the other side. That is a very destructive um, strategy. And I think um, recently in the Hamilton Spectator, there was a terrific article by Steve um, Best, or Buist, um, which um, was a much more um, constructive kind of conversation. A strategy of, of talking to parents which empowers the parent through information. So all the anti-vaccine material presents itself as empowering parents with information. So the same strategy needs to be adopted um, in favor of vaccination. Um, and I would suggest something a little bit um, new, or maybe it's not new, um, which is intervention and collaboration at the peer level and through social networks. So using mother's groups, um, schools, college student groups, books, uh, bookstores, uh, coffee houses, this kind of informal peer-to-peer, uh, -to -peer, they're, they're doing something like that for the, um, for the palliative care, for end-of-life um, conversations, you know, having a, a book club. Um, and again, um, college student um, involvement is probably the most important for this, right? And then also to invite the people that could be um, your enemy to be your friend. So bring those people who run health food stores, um, who um, are alternative uh, medicine practitioners, um, invite them into a conversation. Talk to them um, and see if there are um, sympathetic elements, right, who want to work, um, to work with it. Um, and then take back the internet. The internet is completely dominated by anti-vaccination. So where are the cool memes that are in favor of vaccination? I had to look a long time <laughs> to find our man, Ryan Gosling, who, um, who is always addressing me, hey girl, for, for, for various things. Um, Jimmy Kimmel had a very hilarious segment on his uh, program about vaccination, but there needs to be a response um, which is not uh, preachy, uh, 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 simplistic, um, but which engages people, um, engages their intellect, and engages their, their fear in a way that's fun. Um, and I think that the university has a real um, possible role to play because we're not industry, um, we're not government, we're not interested, um, we um, don't usually talk to the public. <laughs> we just do research, right? We're not um, necessarily um, engaging the public, but that this is, um, I hope, uh, a direction. So thank you for your attention.